Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Madeline Day Delpha, and I am the Assistant Director of Programs and Community Engagement at the Rose Art Museum at Brandeis University. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to acknowledge our land statement, which I hope everyone has a chance to read and take in. Thank you. I am so grateful to all of you for joining us tonight for Parallel Lives, Women of the Iranian Diaspora, a program organized in conjunction with the extraordinary exhibition, Argavan Khosravi, Black Rain, on view at the Rose through October 22nd. We hope you come to the museum to experience this stunning exhibition of Argavan's work. I am honored to introduce our guest this evening. Shala Hieri is professor of anthropology and a former director of the Women's Studies Program at Boston University. Dr. Fieri is one of the pioneers of Iranian anthropology and has produced cutting edge ethnographies of Iran, Pakistan, and the Muslim world. Marjan Kamali is the award-winning author of The Stationery Shop, a national bestseller, and Together Tea, a Massachusetts Book Award finalist. She is a 2022 National Endowment for the Arts Creative Writing Fellowship recipient, and she is currently a scholar in residence at the Women's Studies Research Center at Brandeis University. Argavan Khosravi is the 2023 Ruth Ann and Nathan Perlmutter Artist in Residence. She is exhibited nationally and, nationally and internationally and is a 2019 recipient of the Joan Mitchell Foundation's Painters and Sculptors Grant and a 2017-2018 recipient of the Walter Feldman Fellowship. She is also an alumna of Brandeis' post-baccalaureate program in studio art. So Argavan will start us off by introducing some works from the exhibition. And after each piece, Shala will pose some questions for discussion. If any audience members have questions, you can write them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we'll try to leave some time at the end to address them. So Argavan, um, why don't you start, it off, start us off by telling us a bit about this piece? Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you, Maddie, for the introduction. I um, decided to start the, uh, the presentation with this piece because first it belongs to the Rose Art Museum's collection, but uh, secondly, because um, it was from a series that um, for me, uh, it was like opening a new door in my uh, studio practice. It was the first time I experimented with um, multi-panel paintings. Um, so um, this piece, like the decision to make these multi-panel works Firstly, it was because the because of the logistics, because of the pandemic, I didn't have enough space and I didn't like that that small space dictates the dimension of my work. So I decided to make even larger works. And uh, because of that, I thought of making these multi-panel pieces that at a time I work on a small section and eventually they can be put together to create a large piece. But the more I thought about this idea, it felt more relevant. Um, in a more metaphoric way, uh, because as an immigrant, I feel like I don't belong to any specific space. I am in between places, a part of me, I'm living here, but a part of me is still living back in Iran. So I thought that these like multi-panel paintings that the picture um, is not happening, like the narrative is not happening in just one singular um, pa panel or picture plane felt relevant. Um, and I have some of the recurring visual elements that I have in my work in this piece, for example, like the, um, like that um, male uh, broken uh, sculpture of um, a head above the woman's portrait is appropriated from a Roman sculpture of a green, uh, Greek king which by that I was thinking of how, and the pl placement of that on top of the woman's head and by the play, uh, by looking at um, like where the ear is placed, you, you picture the whole face as if like that male dominant figure is imposing his thoughts on her thoughts. And then you can read into it more symbolically. Also, there are some more elements and symbols of, um, of uh, oppression, uh, like the bull, uh, the shackle, and then on the other side, like on the other hand, um, countering these like elements, there are 
some elements of hope, like uh, the unlocked shackle or the key or the book that the uh, the woman in the background is holding. And the book is also another recurring symbol in my work, which uh, it refers to like knowledge in general, but you can you can have different interpretations. It can be freedom of speech. It can be expressing your thoughts. It can be it can be a free press because my work is reflecting on my me my own memories living in Iran under a suppressive regime. And uh, as you know, like knowledge is like something they don't they don't want the people to achieve. Um, so that's, yeah, that's something that uh, uh, I have more and more in my other works. Um, and the other thing is that there is this like, um, so there there is this contradiction between the 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 elements and the symbols I explained, like the those um black drops that is pouring out of that that sculpture, uh, which with by them I was thinking about oil, a commodity that the Islamic Republic of Iran is depending on. And I was thinking about how most of these rich oil rich countries lack democracy and the correlation between these two subject matters. So that was the other thing that um, happened, like was going uh, in my mind when I was uh, painting this piece. And also like the other thing is like the, which counteracts with all those like negative um, elements in the work is that glowing hand, which is coming out of the rectangle, um, which I, by that I was thinking of like this sense of like power and having agency, like as if eventually she will have things under her control. Um, yeah, that's, yeah, I prefer the rest uh, of what I had in mind to the image to say. Now, Maddie, I'm, I'm done with this one. Um, yeah, so this piece um, is from my most recent work, um, which um, I started last year after last year's uh, uprisings in Iran. Uh, before this piece, although all my work is about the women rights, women rights situation in Iran, um, and although um, the way I portrayed women are not in a weak, victimized situation, but still there are under some unpleasant circumstances um, and they don't have that much power. And I had in my older works prior to this series, some battlefield scenes that um, I had appropriated from miniature paintings, Persian miniature paintings. And by, that, by those scenes, I was thinking of patriarchy. So they were more like, at war in a more intellectual or um, metaphoric level, not, not actual and literal. But after the last year's uprisings and how I, I was witness, I was I witnessed the bravery and courage of Iranian people and mostly women, because those protests were mostly led by women. And the, what triggered those protests was um murder of a woman uh, because of um not wearing her hijab um, correctly, Masajina Aminis. I was very um, inspired at the first, my first reaction was anger um, because of the police brutality which caused this, um, this death uh, and hope. Um, so I decided to channel those feelings in my work. And this is something I always do. Uh, when I'm in the studio painting, the very first purpose of me making anything, making paintings is um, myself. It feels, for me, when I channel those feelings into painting, it's a med meditative process. At the same time, I'm expressing my thoughts and feelings, but also I figure out those thoughts and feelings as well. Before painting something, things are not clear, are on a like lower level of my subconscious in a way, but when I paint them, in a way, I myself become the first audience of the piece. Um, so this piece is one of the examples that's and the series that uh, started after this 
Um, and the other uh, element in this piece is like the notion of duality. There are two sides. So there are two sides to this like column, which also shapes like a missile, another um, um, object of war, which I subverted. And now it forms the woman uh, because she's fighting back to the uh, at the oppressor. Um, so when so the when you look at it at the first sight, um, her eyes are closed and with the headphones on, um, it brings the piece to a more contemporary time because the other elements um, are something that can happen in uh, in the past, like the the motifs and everything. Um, uh, and uh, so yeah, so she, um, she has closed her eyes and. It it gives a feeling as if um, she has like an inward um, pose and she's not paying attention to her surroundings. But when you pay more attention and look at the reflection of the other side in the mirror, you you see that she is staring back at you. Um, and I thought that it's something that um, it also has for me has a symbolic meaning too. Because although I was thinking that although um, like the last year's protests in Iran, the women life freedom movements um, were crushed and um, like on a very um, obvious and clear level, you can't you don't see people protesting on the streets. So they look like the first glance that her eyes are closed and are indifferent to the surroundings. But I look at, uh, I see a lot of videos and images coming from Iran and I talked with my family and a lot of Iranian uh, women and girls, they um, they defy wearing the compulsory hijab in public on the streets, they're showing their hair. And by um, this act on its own, um, they, are sh they are protesting. So that's like the, the next layer, the mirror that you look at and you see that the woman is staring back at you. Um, so yeah, the, the image of hair on its own, uh, and like the hair itself in, in Iran has become like a politi politicized object, politicized co uh, concept. Uh, and that made me thought of, um, incorporating, um, actual human hair in my works, which is the next piece. Um, yeah, this piece. And this piece again, like the other one that you could see, like I I appropriated a helmet, a a, a Persian helmet, um, um, and used it um, to to create a like a, a female protagonist and warrior. Uh, in this piece, I um, appropriated an another object of war, which was this like quiver and arrows. It's upside down. It is another thing that in my earlier works in the battlefield scenes you could see um the soldiers are carrying and now that the like the women's hair in Iran has become like a weapon of war by war I mean like act react acting against their oppressor and standing up to them by not by as an act of civil disobedience I thought that now I um I replaced the feathers at the end of the arrows with these human hairs um, and created this piece, uh, which is an ongoing series. I'm still working on it. And the other element is like these golden threads that are that are in sort of pouring out of her body. And it's uh, something in contrast with the black lines and black boards that were in my previous works, as if like these golden lights are lifting her up. So she's she's rising and she has power and also like the um the sky in the background also suggests like a colorful horizon like hope something as something bright will eventually happen at the future um yeah I, that's i i don't have anything um more to add um, verbally Well, I don't know, uh, Madeleine, would you like us to comment on that? <clears throat> yes, um, please. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I would like um, if you talk about like different different topics. 
um, related to the pieces, like from the first piece to the second and to the third? Um, well, I'm sure Marjon has a lot, but um, I um, also was um, pretty much taken in by your work the first <laughs> time I saw it and the second time. And I had actually pretty much uh, similar ideas. So I was happy to see that I was not too far off in thinking about your very beautiful work. And the only thing I would like to add um, to, to the first piece is that, as you mentioned, uh, the whole idea of book, and as I'm sure Marjan would uh, agree, uh, the whole idea of book is, is knowledge, right? I mean, we write books for a different purposes. We write um, to excite, to incite, to learn, to uh, disseminate knowledge, to um, change history, to um, even as I learned that in Pakistan to murder history because then they, they change it, they can completely change that. So on the whole, I thought about it, knowledge is power, right? And the only object in this wonderful piece you have that it is in its entirety is the book, right? We can't tell the gender of the person behind the book, though we can guess it might be a woman. And the man that you identified as Roman, I thought it was a Neanderthal. <laughs> I thought, I thought, and this black rain, this black thing coming out of the skull, but the skull is completed by a woman. And that woman has an Argavoni shirt on. And I thought <laughs> this was brilliant. <laughs> and has a blue uh, blue um, key. So I thought it was really very good. And, and again, in sense of understanding knowledge being subversive and power, you can understand. I mean, your rage and ours, you know, before you is understandable because for a long time, women in all cultures were prevented from learning. Just think what they're doing in uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan. Even in Iran, they really truly believe that women are novice or act. They cannot have, they can't be as intellectually uh, powerful as men are. So now that women in Iran are becoming very intellectually very powerful, they're trying to restrict some of the fields that they can they can take. So I, I thought it was just a really... Um, very interesting. And just, just to add in sense of what you said about my own book, you know, my last book about the queens of Islam was just to, not only just to say what we have there, what women do have there, but also to um, challenge some of the narratives that are out there about Muslim women, the colonial narrative that thinks women are passive, uh, victimized, uh, unagentic. At the same time, the male elite think that women have to be oppressed and, uh, you know, kept at home. So I was challenging both of these narratives. But I have some questions for you. And Madron, I hope you don't mind me asking these questions. Um, so, you know, just um, again, looking at your, um, at your um, image, the first image, um, I, um, I mean, the whole idea of black rain was very, intriguing to me and I'd like you to explain as you did briefly but also the idea of the only thing that is being complete is the book and of course I know that as you mentioned you're inspired by Ferdowsi and all these um, amazing books that we have and I do have a similar question for Marjan but I want Marjan to ask you the questions before I go on and ask Marjan some questions um, I think you know Aravon, that that first piece that you shared with us, um, there's so many layers to it, and we've discussed some of them already. But the thing that struck me the most was that the book was, as um, as Shaha said, the most complete. And also, the person is hiding behind the book, but also protected by it. And I think that that's something that all of us have probably experienced. Um, as Iranian women who use books or art to express our sense of rage or our sense of powerlessness. The book is throughout history for all cultures dangerous, which is why even right now in the United States, we're banning books mm -hmm. um, because they seem to be so incredibly threatening. Um, 
to some people, and and I don't discount that threat because people are are fearful of what's contained in the books. And um, the only thing, the last thing I'll say is that uh, for me, seeing that piece, the thing that I take away with it most is the person behind the book is safe, at least for now. I was also very intrigued by the oil because the oil, uh, for those of us who come from countries that are rich in oil, it is a burden and a curse. Um, and I feel like if our countries were not rich in oil, we would be so much better off because other countries wouldn't want the oil and the whole ripple effect of um, this tremendous interference and also corruption within the country itself would maybe be mitigated. Yeah, exactly. Marjan, that brings me, sorry, I'm just going to say that, Marjan, that brings me to the very... Um, uh, topic of your book, the social history of Mossadegh and the fact that he was overthrown through, you know, a uh, coup d'etat engineered by the CIA, precisely because of the oil, as you mentioned. Yes, I think it was, um, you know, this, the idea in 1953 of Iran having a leader that wanted to nationalize its own oil was outrageous to the companies that were profiting um, from that oil, British Petroleum, uh, the, the version of uh, British Petroleum of that time. Um, and I think that's exactly why I feel it is a curse because it's created so much trauma, um, so much sort of historical and generational loss. Um, just because the country under its earth contains this resource that, you know, is is wanted and coveted by so many. So when I was writing The Stationery Shop, I did a lot of research about that time. And it was very edifying to learn that things were planned down to the minute. You know, we 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 think of history. I love what you said about um, in Pakistan, the sense of murdering history because um, one of the epigraphs to the book is there is nothing new in the world except the history you do not know. I think that's true for countries. We have a misunderstanding, especially about Iran. We, I think in the United States, people think everything in Iran began in 1979. Nothing could be truer. Um, but the history we don't know about countries and about people is all that stuff under the surface is I think what maybe we're trying to excavate when, as you said, Aravon, you're sitting in your studio and meditating. It's the same for me when I'm writing. I'm trying to figure out what it is I think, what it is I feel about these characters and this story. And it's only through having your fingers on the keyboard or your pen on the page that you actually learn what it is you want to say. Yeah, exactly. Because before, um, like you writing, so putting your subconscious or thoughts into words or me into images or shahla uh, in other ways, they don't become an object outside of you as an entity. So, but when you create this this artwork or this piece, it's something that exists exists outside of you. So you can look at it and. Sometimes you can surprise yourselves that what what was um, lying beneath the surface in your thoughts, in your feelings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I thought the your second piece also very um, provocative, and uh, and like you, um, I um, um, felt that. Oops. Um, where are we? Uh, the images, right? Um, so um, you know, it it is just that uh, oftentimes women uh, don't know exactly what is expected of them, how they ought to behave. Uh, they're often being shamed for just for being a woman. So and you know, like um, for the very fact that men 
it seems that, I mean, I always say wearing the veil is uh, inconvenient for women, but it's an, it's an insult to men because the idea is that men cannot um, contain uh, their desires and they say it, which is really very uh, amazing. But what I, when I looked at this image, I thought while the woman seems to be compliant or at least at some level serene, as you said, is just now you know, drawing into herself, but the whole contraption is like a weapon, right? But the weapon that has some religious symbolism in it, like the hood and the 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 feathers that are coming out. But then at the same time, she seems to be aware. I mean, that's where the importance of this image lies, that you're not saying or you're not uh, conveying the idea that this woman is only compliance. It to me it looks more like a ruse, like a uh, um, you know, um, I don't want to say a trick, but a knowledge about you know understanding what is going on, and you behave the way that sometimes you're expected to behave, while at the same time you're quite aware of what goes on. It's in fact behind her is as if like having two eyes, you know, four eyes, two in the front, two in the back. So um, I thought. Uh, you know, it, this was quite interesting, but I, I didn't know that you had uh, conceived of this beautiful image after in the aftermath of a woman life freedom. And uh, maybe you can just talk a little bit more about that. And then, you know, of course, the background of the uh, mirror, the mirror is very significant for, for Muslims. I mean, for Iranians, shall we say, and that whole idea again um, of having a, uh, the woman seen in the mirror. Maybe you can just talk a little bit more about that. Sure, yeah. You're totally right about how um, like women are expected to behave in certain ways as if and mostly in patriarchal societies, but unfortunately universally everywhere, as if there is this mold that women should fit into, otherwise they're not accepted by the society or um, so yeah, I, I really feel that 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 notion um, about this series of works. Yeah, they were inspired by last year's uprisings. As uh, and as I mentioned, I had in my previous works like these battlefield scenes that um, soldiers are attacking the women in the paintings, but they were signif in significantly in a smaller scale than like the more dominant uh, women figures. Uh, but I decided now that women are standing up against their oppressor, they wear the war clothes, like the helmet. So this, like the, with the feathers, it's, it was an actual helmet um, for, I think, 17th century Iran. And like these feathers, ev everything, like the, all the details were the same. The only, my intervention was to, it was, round and I created this um this shape so that with the with the rectangular uh, shape of the portrait it can make a whole piece and the other thing that was interesting for me was was, was this image of uh, feathers because you you are familiar with these with these objects in like different religious ceremonies and um so on but like this image of feather is something I had in my previous work and it started with the symbol of bird, which is another recurring element in my work as a symbol of freedom. And then I used an actual feather so that it's it's like an standing for the bird. And now that women were fighting for freedom, I thought that's, that feels really, that felt really appropriate to to have this object, which in real life used to have these like feathers placed on top of it, and um, and uh, and narrate my my own story through that. And about the the mirror, uh, this the mirror was also appropriated from a historic object. Um, there there was this tradition of making mirror cabinets in Iran during mostly during the Qajar dynasty. Um, so yeah, I was I was inspired by those, but uh, they were smaller, and um, I made it larger to so that it feels more proportionally right to the piece. 
Um, so if someone comes from someone coming from Iran gets those like um, like cultural hints. Uh, and yeah, you were right. Also, there are some drawings of like birds and flowers um, like on the around the mirror, uh, which um, th that's another tradition in Iran that uh, has um, and mostly because there were at some points uh, like prohibition of depicting human body. So mostly like arabesque designs and also like flower, like flowers and birds was something that artists would make and it was a symbol of heaven. Um, and in my work, when I use these elements as whether it's like flower and birds or um, like landscapes, I'm thinking of heaven, but more uh, like um, materialistically, like an ideal place where all these things have been achieved. Uh, so that's another thing that uh, felt in line with like the, the idea of fighting for freedom to, to reach. I like that when you say the whole idea of true to the self, when she's uh, pretending or is uh, or seems to be incompliant, she's like a weapon that is dangerous. But when she's aware of herself and her eyes are open, she's within the paradise with, with flowers, with birds, with, uh, with uh, other things that are pleasant in life. Rather than just, but but again, the juxtaposition of um, the whole idea of weapon, but being that weapon, taking some religious symbolism to it, yet at the same time being true to yourself and, um, you know, enjoying the, I mean, even though the face seems to be angry and, um, you know, uh, rage, nonetheless, the environment seems to be different. Yeah, and, and determined. Yeah, yes. you're right. Because if I was thinking if someone goes, for example, to Tehran, someone who's not familiar with the culture, thinks that everything is normal. Last year there was these protests, but now everything is back to normal. But the, 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 the act of not wearing the compulsory hijab that you see that so many people, I, I saw videos of girls wearing like crop tops someone who's not familiar with with the culture wouldn't get it but it's an act of resistance which is Absolutely. very powerful and it's something that has has been woven into the fabric of uh, um, Iranian women's everyday life uh which i'm sure will lead to something um yeah something uh greater Uh, John, like, would you? Yeah, what's your reflection? Yeah, something that really struck me about this piece is that um, it reminded me of how, as women, we're constantly underestimated. the The version that people have, especially sadly, of Iranian women or women from Muslim countries, is that they're submissive, they're oppressed, therefore they're quiet you know, the eyes closed, and not necessarily paying attention. But the truth is really what you see in the mirror, which is, they are paying attention, they are watching, they're well aware. And I just feel like this image, um, if I want to get a little personal, summarizes so much of my life where, you know, upon Upon meeting a woman, especially if they know your cultural background or if you're soft-spoken, there is an assumption that you just are moseying along with your eyes closed. Uh, but the truth could be uh, nothing further. Uh, you know, we are really the woman in the mirror. We are taking notes. We are making plans. We are producing our art. And that that is something I really appreciated you showing the juxtaposition. And for me, it's so much about being underestimated. Yeah, totally. I think this is a part of it is also because of like the portrayal, portrayal of women coming from that region through the media, the Western media. Um, I was talking with, with a writer um, a while ago, and she was saying that as if, and I, I that really let what she said really resonated with me 
that the media creates this image of the Middle Eastern woman as if they are like victims that we should go and rescue them. Mm-hmm. So it's it like if you look at the big picture, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's I think a part of it is because of that, and right. that's why I feel that self-expression and telling your own story from your own perspective really, really exactly. matters. Uh, Every time I told people when I was writing my last book, and it's called The Unforgettable Queens of Islam, every time people would ask me, I mean, mostly Americans, and I'd say I'm writing about Muslim queens, and they say, what? Are there any queens? And I said, yes, there were, in fact, a lot more than we know of in other uh, cultures. So, yes, there are all these assumptions, and that was part of my idea of challenging uh, the assumption, uh, the narrative about um, Muslim women in general. Yes, and I think because there's so little agency, sadly, politically, economically, um, right now for women in Iran, the assumption is that that means that, you know, you, you sit down with your eyes closed. But because there is so little agency, so much resilience has been built. You know, does anybody know an Iranian woman who's not strong and I think the answer is no, because we have to be, we don't have a choice. Um, so there's so much sort of stacked against you that you 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 have to rise up. And I feel the agency that you're using, Aravan in your art and Shahla with your scholarship. And, you know, for me with just creative writing, that's a way of sort of mining the agency that we do have and multiplying it, putting it out into the world and making the most of what little we can do. Yeah, exactly. And this, when you mentioned lack of agency, like how women have lack of agency in Iran, I thought that it's, it's unfortunately, it's not limited to women, like different ethnicities, uh, different sects of Islam in Iran, like Shia, Sunni. So it's only a specific group of people who their ideology aligns with with the government. They only have that like um, power and agency, and the rest are yeah are are oppressed. Um, yeah. Well, these are parts of the assumptions. If I may just add that, um, because I've been going back and forth to Iran, of course. Um, Arghavan came about a few years ago, but I've been here for a long time going back and forth, and I have seen the changes. Women do have agencies, but the structures that allow them to operationalize these agencies varies. And as we saw, I mean, where did all these amazing determination and agency of women during the Women Life Freedom, you know, come from? You know, where did it uh, come from? It's amazing. So, um, they are agentic, but as you show in this piece, they know where to play it and how to play it. You know, where to show that they do have agency, the eyes are open, they're aware, and they know what's going on, yet they can just withdraw because of the oppressive patriarchal structure. So it's it's important to understand that women do have that, that agency, but they're very careful about where and how and with whom they exercise that agency. Yeah, this is the last piece I talked about, uh, which I, uh, as I mentioned, it's like the aftermath of last year's protests and something that is going on um which this is an ongoing series i'm working on new pieces in which i'm um incorporating human hair uh, because like i think in in all religions in a in their radical forms it's about policing women's bodies um unfortunately and hair is one of those those uh those parts which is um very restricted and um and in in Iran it has become politicized it's not it's not something 
about religion anymore. It's about politics. It's like, mm. yeah. So yeah, it was. I I heard it somewhere that it's like the the, the Berlin Wall. If the compulsory hijab hijab falls down, then nothing stands and it's in its place in Iran. Very good, very good. Um, this I have to say, uh, Algawan, this is one of my favorite pieces because I think you really, really captured the uh, tension. Uh, contradictions between the ideological religious um, ideas, uh, discourse, and then what I want to say is about the erotic discourse, which you know all our poets have talked about women's hair. But I just want to add, uh, say a few things that how it's important to understand this issue of hair, because hair and gaze, you know, one of the reasons that women are supposed to cover themselves is that they can block the gaze, the male gaze that is his and Harze and just looks at them. So these, uh, the hair and gaze are intimately intertwined with social order, sexual relations, and gender, gender hierarchy. Now, at the nexus of the hair and gaze, you know, I'm just not going to be a little bit more um, <laughs> scholarly because I think it is so important to talk about that that we see the cultural conceptualization of sex, violence, and power. That's what we see, right? So because the hair has materiality, then the Islamic Republic knows that it's going to cover women's hair, but they cannot control and police the gaze, you know? So that's why, you know, men have all this, the gaze. But at the same time, we have the erotic discourse, you know, Hafez talks about the women's, you know, zolf and, Almost every male poet talks about the hair. What I like about your work is that you seem to have captured the beauty of the uh, uh, erotic discourse. And you turn this whole hair into bows that can at any time be picked and thrown. And where it is going to go? Right in the heart of men and those who are opposing that, right? And it's, it's just great. The only thing that I, which sort of uh, uh, made me ponder and want to ask you questions and, uh, and, and match on too, is this whole, I mean, this bag looks like a bag where you hold your, ba your bows in it. But then it's, again, the woman's mouth, right? So she can say something. She can just say, he's toy, has it, toy, zana, oz, or the man. You are literous. You are, uh, um, you know, lewd, I am the respectable woman. So I I mean, I'd like you to comment on this whole idea of having the mouth shown mm -hmm. through the bag where the uh, bows of hair are uh, located. Yeah, exactly. I wanted, so her face is covered and the only um, like part of the her face you can see is the mouth, which su suggests expressing herself through that like the th through the quiver that's the only place that that's the only space that she can um, she can express herself um and also i i i was aware that i didn't want to portrait the figure in a more in a sexualized way so like the clothes are so you, i'm not showing that much skin not that much because I, I didn't want to cater to that like male gaze so it's mostly the clothes um yeah and also like the quiver is is embracing her is protecting her uh, yes. with, with 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 arrows that are made of hair um and what you said like the hair and arrows reminded me of that that religious saying that when men are looking at, uh, I don't know, Mahram, what can it be in, in, in English? Like women who are not from their family, as if they are, it's like arrows shooting out of, um, from out of Satan's, something like yeah. that. And it's, right. it's some sort of subverts that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that ridiculous notion. Yeah, and I love how the quivers separate the hair into specific strands. So, you know, usually 
um, I was I was a child in Iran when the laws changed, and it was really fascinating how one day it was okay to be out on the street with your hair flowing in the sun, and then suddenly this was a crime. Um, but whenever you think of women's hair, even in the women life freedom movement, the images we saw, all the pictures we saw, it's um, you know it's it's always flowing as a, as a big sort of beautiful thing in the wind, but you've separated them into strands and it almost demystifies it, takes away um, all of the incredible myth and lore that we've put into women's hair in our culture, where, you know, I remember when I was growing up, it was um, the biggest sort of power you had was your head of hair and if you just step back it's it's astounding how as you said it does feel a bit like the berlin wall because it would be so easy i think for this regime to live longer if it just gave in on this one thing but they won't this is this is the hill they will die on thanks <laughs> like one of the columns if it breaks then the whole structure can't hold on and about like different i i really appreciate that you notice like how the different strands of hair create this one piece because i was thinking how this is a collective action if there's only one woman on the streets not wearing their hijab then she can get arrested and but when there's it's everyone it's it, this collective action. You cannot you cannot silence that. You cannot arrest everyone. You don't have space to 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 pre imprison all the women. So yeah, it's it's yeah, uh, it's very inspiring and um, yeah. yeah. It's this this fear and fascination with women's hair, you know. And of course, much as I said is written about it, and there are all kinds of structural, emotional. Um, psychological reason behind it. But this piece um, really um, just brings it out. And as you said, in its collectivity, in its separateness, the power that women's hair maintain, but this fear that the uh, Islamic Republic has. And as Marjon very aptly said, that maybe that's the hill on which they, <laughs> they eventually stumble and and um, yeah, let's see. Well, let's hope to that day. <laughs> hope for that day. I also may but I just add that, Madeline. I'm sorry. I'm just going to add <clears throat> one more thing. I like the <clears throat> idea that, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, Arravan um, mentioned about the idea of liminality in betweenness of us exile people you know like i think that is very important and that comes out through some of these images uh, i mean one can talk a lot about them so i i'm just going to stop here but i also appreciate that whole idea of liminality that you talked about um we being uh in, and, and marjon beautifully writes it in her in her book last book um about you know these women who travel came to america the two sisters so I thought that was very nice. Well, I was going to go to some questions, but Marjan, I'd like to give you a chance to, and Argavan too, to respond to that before we do. Um, I think it's something that really spoke to me when Argavan first expressed it. You know, I first read about it um, in in her description of this exhibit and we're all living on the hyphen. Um, even in my first book, the most popular paragraph was a paragraph about the main character feeling like she's living on the hyphen between Iranian and American. Neither side belongs to her. And after a while, she learns to enjoy that space. Um, it gives her a perspective that being on just one side or the other wouldn't give. It can feel maybe some days um, like you're an acrobat balancing on a tight wire, but on other days you can sit on the hyphen and swing your legs. And it's something that I've definitely internalized, not just in my work, but in my everyday life. 
I do feel like I straddle that hyphen. I used to sort of resent it. I've come to see it as incredibly empowering. You can choose to pick the best from both worlds. Um, that's the best way of looking at it. And in the stationery shop, as Shahla said, you know, when the two sisters first moved from Iran to America, in that first year, the main character feels like she's blind. Because sometimes when you move to a new culture, it can feel like you've lost your senses. You, you can't express yourself. You can't speak the language. And it can feel like you're sort of just fumbling in the dark. But eventually, just like your eyes adjust to darkness when you come in from the sun, things start to take shape and you start to function and excel in the new culture. So I appreciate very much what you said, Aragon, and everything that you show in your work about um, just straddling that thin space. Thank you. I wanted to, to add that one of the occasions that I really feel that hyphen space you mentioned is the holidays. Like the Persian New Year for me doesn't feel like New Year anymore because when I'm stepping outside of our house, everything is normal, like like everyday life. And like the, the, the Christmas and like this holiday doesn't feel like a new year. So I, I don't know how many more years I need to adjust. So that's like for me where this, this notion of in between places is really crystallized. Uh, and when you said that um, it's something that you can look at it positively, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it will be. We can try <laughs> <laughs> on the good days. <laughs> Along those lines, that ties very well into our first question I'm going to take from the Q&A, um, which is, how does your life in the U.S. shape your view of Iran and your creative work? And is it asked from me or I to all to all three? Oh, okay. So should I should I start? Um, for me, um, so when I came here after a year, because um, before that um, I was only abroad. When I was living in Iran, I was only abroad for like vacations, not only two weeks or so. So when I came here, that like psychological and geographical distance made me look back at my experiences and memories from Iran and and look at it from a different perspective because you know that the situation is unjust but this is the only situ situation that you have experienced when you're in Iran with all those like uh, restrictions um, so it really helped me to 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 really realize how unjust the situation is although I knew it was unjust but but it's it was on another level and that was actually why i started to reflect on that in my in my work because for me it was like a coping mechanism to to cope with the all the traumas i had um thinking about home um so yeah that was one of the very first impacts which stays until this day I think for me, my time in Iran was so short uh, that so much of my work, I think both books I've written and the third one, which just finishing literally this week, um, you know, sometimes people say to me, why do you write about Iran if you weren't really there for that long? And that's exactly why I write about it, because I have this sort of insatiable curiosity about it. And I feel the country my parents grew up in, the country they cherish, the country they remember has gone. And so I'm always trying to somehow capture it. And I feel if I pin it down with words, if I pin it down with plot or character or setting, maybe it's a way of me trying to capture this elusive um, beauty that is constantly slipping through my own fingers, you know, so that being in the US, being overseas, really in different countries that are not Iran is mostly my experience. But from this perch, 
I try to do a lot of research and to sort of, I hate the word humanize, but <laughs> it just, I, because it's ridiculous, but you know what I mean, to, to just show people this other side that is rarely, sadly shown in the media. Well, I mean, I, I I would like to have more questions so that uh, people can ask Abraham and um, Marjan more questions. But for me, I've been here for a long time. And um, when I came here, we didn't have any of these, um, you know, fancy technology of um, uh, iPhone and, um, you know, Zoom and Skype and this, that or the other. So I terribly miss my parents. But anyways, I managed to finally, as uh, uh, both Marjon and uh, Aragon said, you know, being completely disoriented when we had the ceremonies, you know, the Noruz or the Christmas and this, that or the other. Um, but for me, the being really truly liminal came about when uh, after the revolution and I wanted to start another project and I just you know, I was not, accept I mean, I was not welcomed in Iran because I was too Americanized. I was not welcomed in America because I was of Iranian background. So I decided to go to Pakistan. And then even there, you know, so I had three <laughs> countries, none of which was quite, um, um, you know, at the time. I mean, they were welcoming. Pakistan was, of course, quite nice. It, it, it turned out to be a very, very nice experience. Eventually, as Marjan said, you know, you eventually find your way and, and you live through it. But it's one of the nice. At the same time, I think it's a it's a privilege to be able to um, have a different horizon, to learn a different language, to get to know different people, and to have the ability to do a lot of other things that you might not have been able to do it back, you know, in your home country. So it has its own advantages and uh, disadvantages. We have another question, which I believe is for Argavon. Um, this is the first question that came through. Um, Sandy says, all three pieces have elements of being closed off, of faces that are partially covered or partially revealed. Can you speak to your thoughts on ways that these figures are empowered versus powerless? Uh, because this is like the, uh, because all my work is about contradiction and this like, action reaction these like positive negative everything is so it creates that sort of balance or um and it's it's like visually and metaphorically it's it's the situation in iran it's nothing is um tipped to to one side um and the, the faces i'm in some works you can see the full face like the second piece in some works um the faces are covered or they're uh they're obscured and i i thought that this creates some sort of curiosity or activates the imagination that who that person could be and also by um covering the identity it can be anyone so anyone can relate to that person coming from different experiences and walks of life. And it can be a stand-in for, for a group of people who, who are in similar situations. And um, about like the, 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 this topic of power, although they seem to be in situations that if it's unpleasant, it's restricted, but they have some sort of elegance and um power to their pose and control and confidence that suggests that this situation is not going to last for long. Things are going to change. Uh, so yeah, that's my thought process. Well, that's a very inspiring note on which to end. I want to thank all of you for this um, really fascinating and um, wide ranging conversation. And I did want to let everyone know um, that we have some upcoming programs that we hope you'll join us for as well. We have an artist talk on Friday. Marjan is going to be doing a creative writing workshop at the Rose this Sunday. And then finally, Argavan is going to do an artist talk on October 14th. So thank you all again for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you at the Rose and at some of our other upcoming programs.
Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Maddie. Thank Maddie. It was Maddie. lovely Maddie. being on the same panel with Marjona and Al Gabor. It was really just lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.